Um, I'm honored to present Julia as the first speaker. She did her medical school training in Tübingen in Germany, did her PhD in medical psychology and ethics there, and came to Luzerne for her training in pediatric surgery, where she started doing some research in career opportunities in pediatric surgery. She is currently continuing her training in Munich at the Hauna Kinderspital and has focused her research in simulation, simulation training in pediatric surgery currently. One of her greatest achievements towards gender equality has been reached. She was the first woman to be able to continue operating during her pregnancy. Before that, and that was only last year, all women were banned from the operating theater when they announced their pregnancy. Julia, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sabine, for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you everyone for the opportunity to have this talk tonight. Um, so I'm gonna start with basically all the facts that Steffi and I found and Sabine um, years ago when I was in Luzern and now with uh, Steffi um, about the gender career gap in pediatric surgery. So the current state about it. So when this French artist designed the cover of the New Yorker uh, in 2017, um, she hit a nerve. Um, Surgeons from all over the world, especially female surgeons, took photos of themselves um, in the OR, and the hashtag, I look like a surgeon, went viral on social media. It revealed an international dissatisfaction with gender inequality in surgery, and people were discussing modern team structures in surgery. So I'm now going to talk about whether this career gap also exists in pediatric surgery and what it looks like. So we can start with a little uh, history session. You probably all know these guys. William Ladd, um, the father of pediatric surgery. Robert Gross, the first surgeon, uh, or did the first surgical correction of a patent duck. And the most famous pediatric surgeon alive, Michael Gaudera, who invented the PEC in 1979 together with Jeffrey Ponsky. But do you also know Benji Brooks? She was actually accidentally accepted as a pediatric surgical fellow by Robert Gross because her name sounds like a boy. But eventually she became the first female pediatric surgeon of the US and she was the first person that designed small instruments for our, our pediatric patients. But I'm sure not all of you have heard of her. So maybe she should have done it like Margaret Balkley. She decided to live as a man, as James Barry, in order to be accepted at uni and in order to be able to become a surgeon, and she did. And she became famous as a surgeon in the British Army, um, with her gender only being discovered after her death. But that's all history, uh, luckily for us. <laughs> um, but what's the situation like for women in surgery today? Um, even though the majority of medical students um, is female today, only about a third of surgeons are women. Um, and this graph shows that this has in, um, improved over decades, slightly, but it has, um, and it, that it depends um, heavily on the, on the surgical specialty that you're in. So where are we in pediatric surgery? Um, we're actually doing quite well uh, with 30 to 50% of pediatric surgeons um, being female. But that's only until you start looking at the leading positions. So that's a graph that shows the majority of students, uh, medical students being female, leading to just a minority um, in leading uh, women in leading positions. And that's um, about 10% for um, um, leaders in surgery being women. And most importantly, there has been no improvement over decades. In pediatric surgery, we're not doing a lot better, actually. It's 10 to 15% of our leaders are female. Um, and that's just a little bit above the mean. Um, and this is called the glass ceiling effect. So in literature, um, they, uh, that's one of the ways you can call it. 
um, a woman trying to reach those leading positions and she can't because there is a glass ceiling. And this effect you can also see in the academic world. So that's a graph um, from Zurich University from 2022. And it shows again the same development, a majority of students at the uni being female, and then just a minority of full professors um, being women. And that's, um, this effect is even stronger in medicine overall, and especially strong in surgery. And also pediatric, pediatric surgeons are not doing better at that. Um, it's only below 15% of our professors are female. So what do we know about the gender pay gap? Um, that's a study from the US from 2021. Um, and they um, found out that female physicians um, earn about $2 million less than their male colleagues throughout their whole career. And again, biggest difference in surgery. And that's not only true for the US. So that's a graph that shows the difference for all OECD countries. So in every country, we have a difference. Um, and the mean is 12% difference between men and women, women's weight. Um, and here are just some examples. So Italy is doing quite well. And the UK and the United States States, not, not really well. Um, Germany is quite close, actually. Um, and even after adjusting fact, uh, the factors, medical specialty and number of hours work, uh, women uh, just earn less money. But we all know that we're not doing the job just for the money. Um, probably all of us um, do it because we have a um, we're enthusiastic about what we're doing. So what do pediatric surgeons think about that job? Um, even in literature, no matter where, uh, which paper you read, um, the highest career satisfaction am among all surgical specialties can be found in pediatric surgery. And also, um, it is described that pediatric surgical re residents are highly motivated. But despite this, they also say that it's a high rate of workload and that they are stressed by a work-home conflict. So what's that? What's a work-home conflict? So that's an image of um, the traditional role model, but you could also say in a positive way, clearly defined responsibility. And that has changed. Um, so that's an image of how it's like today, a woman trying to be both and trying to do both at once. And you can just imagine, no matter how well organized you are and um, what you do, it's just a high rate of workload. Um, and that's true for both gender genders, actually. Uh, not just for men, women, also for men. And um, just in a different way, kind of. So um, here's why. Um, female pedi pediatric surgeons say that their family is um, their main career barrier. They say that they have the feeling of having um, to work twice as hard, even if there is no desire to have children, and that they feel disadvantaged due to pregnancy and childcare. Men, on the other hand, say career is kind of a family barrier for them. Um, they feel that they have to compensate for female part-time workers, and that they don't really have the possibility to work part-time, or they don't feel like they have. And they feel like they have less opportunities to spend time with their families compared to their female colleagues, even if they want to. And this is also called um, organizational climate. And if that's poor and um, that's described um, um, a lot and is getting more, that it leads to discontent, discontent among residents. And it's the main determinant of burnout among residents. So burnout, I don't think I need to explain burnout syndrome, what it is, but it's uh, the question, where are we in pediatric surgery? That's an abscess survey from 2021, and uh, that revealed an overall burnout rate from those participants, um, pediatric surgeons from the US of 24%, but that was all career stages. Um, and that's the thing, the younger um, you are, the higher is 
uh, your risk for burnout. And for residents, that's about 30 to 40 percent in surgical specialties and also in pediatric surgery. And that's, for example, um, um, from um, a study in 2019, and they also found out a burnout rate um, of 38 percent. And that's always the case. Female um, surgical residents have a higher risk than males, but in this study, that was not um, statistically significant. So what does that mean for our society? Burnout is, is just not a problem for the individual person. It also has an effect on the work they do, on the productivity, on the teamwork they're doing. It's getting uh, less efficient. And um, most importantly, the quality of care and patient safety um, gets worse. Um, we do more mistakes. Um, and the risk of substance abuse and suicide rises as well. Moreover, surgical residents are thinking about or even leaving training programs due to those um, poor organizational climates that they feel. So concluding, we can say gender career gap in pediatric surgery means that we have a high ratio of female surgeons in pediatric surgery Compared, compared to other surgical specialties, but they still lead less and they earn less. Um, for both genders, that means there is a work-home conflict and that's um, being described more often uh, throughout the last year for both genders and the organizational climate is described as um, poor and leading towards a high workload for both genders that they describe, even though they're really um, enthusiastic and satisfied with the job. Um, and that's leading to increasing numbers of burnout and dropout rates. So considering the fact that there is going to be a shortage of surgeons um, in Germany, all over Europe, um, and um, there, it's just the calculation, but it will be about 15,000 in 2035. And um, the question arises whether we can keep up the quality of care in pediatric surgery in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, I guess we're going to the second presentation and then we discuss uh, together. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Steffi Meyer to you all. Uh, Steffi is a consultant pediatric surgeon uh, in the University Hospital in Leipzig. Um, her, her clinical focus is on burns and plastic surgery, but she is also uh, actively engaging in an academic pediatric surgery career. Uh, she has spent uh, some time uh, during her training also with uh, Jan de Prest in Leuven, um, conducting research on uh, CDH. And uh, she was recently awarded the prestigious Richard uh, Drachter Prize uh, of the German Society of Pediatric Surgery. Um, and this prestigious prize uh, was given only three times so far uh, to a woman in the last 50 years. And uh, the last time it was given to Steffi. Um, Steffi uh, also received another um, a, a great award, which is called the FemSearch uh, Award during her residency um, for navigating the residency uh, and uh, her family uh, at the same time. Uh, we might hear about that also a little bit later. And yeah, Steffi is not just a pediatric surgeon. She is also uh, the mother of three children. And it's my absolute pleasure to uh, now uh, give the mic to, to Steffi. Thank you. Thank you Ak, for this kind introduction. So we heard about a lot about the current state and now I want to add some information about the background and perspectives that we have regarding the gender career gap in pediatric surgery. So 20 years ago, 
um, 95 female um, pediatric surgeons were asked what they think are the obstacles to their career. And 60% uh, of them were academic, 60% were married, 46 had children. And they reported that the huge clinical load, their major role in childcare and household, as well as the lack of protected time for, a, for an academic career, and the lack of mentorship, as well as departmental support, were the main reason, reasons for having no career. And how is it today? 182 pediatric surgeons from the German-speaking countries in Europe, half of them females and half of them males, were asked about their career perspectives. And surprisingly, still 60% of the females think that men have better chances to have a career in pediatric surgery. On the contrary, three quarters of the males reported they, that they think gender doesn't play a role. Interestingly, one third of the, of the women only are aiming at the leading position, while this was true for two thirds of the males. So do the women only feel disadvantaged? Are they disadvantaged? What is true? Don't they want to have a career? And do all men aim higher? What we have to take into account when we talk about this topic are our unconscious bias that we all have. The same cohort of pediatric surgeons were asked what they think is the surgical culture and the surgical picture that they have. And they reported on the one hand that the males are strong and uncomplicated, resilient and confident. And the females are the busy bees. They are empathic, they are team players, they are humble and they are accurate and effective. And these biases are true for all genders, generations and positions and they may diminish our effective work and induce inequality. Do we have an example for this? Yes, 364 letters of recommendations to pediatric surgery fellows, half of them females and half of them males uh, were analyzed. They have had all the same re research and leading leadership backgrounds and the authors were mostly male. What did they find? The male surgeons, the male trainees got agentic terms, then first names were named. There were terms like that he will have a future success, he developed, he researched, and a very active possessive language. On the other hand, for the females, social communicated phrases were, uh, were emphasized, smooth accomplishments were mentioned, only for the women, never for the men, and a lot of conjoining adjectives were used. So this uh, may have an impact on the future career of both genders. And we should be aware of that when we are, when we are writing, for example, letter of recommendations and also when we read it. So, but it's not only about feelings and bias, it's also uh, about numbers. Janet all analyzed 550,000 cases of 131 uh, surgeons operated during 20 years. And they found that the female surgeon had a lower number of cases, they operated more on their peers and they had less male referrals. And more importantly, while for the males, the increase in index cases uh, was uh, significantly over time. So with their growing surgical experience, that was not the case for the females. They always stayed the same and they differed more urgently between the males and the surgeons over time. So we see a disparity that increases with seniority at the URR, and we don't have any improvement over 20 years. And in pediatric surgery, the same group also analyzed 51 uh, female and male pediatric surgeons that are mainly working at the major teaching hospital. And they also found here in our field that the number of cases, the number of index cases, and the net networks that the female surgeons have um, smaller, significantly smaller than for the males. And this underemployment has not only an impact on the mental health, career and performance of the female surgeon, but also on the health system because we lose and underemploy under, um, females that can have, that can do a, a good job. So how is it in uh, academics? Uh, we are happy to see that during the last 30 years, the number of first and last authorships of females increased by 25% uh, 
and, and 70% respectively. And also nowadays, when we are participating in pediatric surgery conferences, 50% 50, 50 of the moderators and speakers are female. However, when we look at the um, pediatric surgery society, society, they are only almost only men that are leaders there. So the women are underrepresented and it didn't change during the last 20 years. It's still only about 10% female presidents. So how can we overcome this gender gap that is influenced by so many um, direct and indirect factors? At first, if you want to have a career, you need and should outline an individual plan. This depends on your aims, your values, your um, personal situation, your strengths and weaknesses. And to do so, at first, you should identify a mentor to um, define and discuss your goals and expectations and to line out how to come there. Here in this paper, there's a very nice 12 step-by-step -step approach how to do it, and you can download it via the QR code. Moreover, you should always be eager to learn, especially if you don't have a good training at your institution. You should use all the information that is available, for example, using uh, at, at attending UPSA, webinars using the State Current app, being on um, YouTube, or participating in real life, either, for example, for your national um, uh, residency courses or for the UPSA bootcamp for, uh, for the trainees. And you should challenge yourself. You should participate in the EPSA exam uh, once a year, and you should finalize your residency um, accomplishing the PDAP surgery exams. Of course, surgery, it's, it uh, depends also on talents, but also on training. So if you want to become one of the best, you should train also as one of the best. Here you see, for example, a laparoscopic trainer, and you can buy it for at home for about 30, 350 uh, euros. And if you uh, train a lot, you will always also have an improved experience and an improved um, performance in the UR. You can also attend one of the uh, training courses that are available, especially for um, pediatric surgery, for example, the ERCAT course. And if you practice a lot, like our train, trainee Ophelia, you may also be one of the uh, women, uh, and I think it's almost always women, that um, win the laparoscopic suturing contest. If you focus on a research career, you should look out for a research fellowship. Like uh, almost all of our young surgeons that are interested in a career go abroad, for example, to Harvard, to Toronto, to Winnipeg, or to John Hopkins. And there you, on, you not only publish paper, but you learn how to think scientifically, you learn how to write grants, you learn how to discuss in a scientific matter and to present your data. And this is a key step for your career, independent of your gender. And what, does, what do the females need? They need more empowerment. So they need visibility. Um, you should go out and post on social media, what are you doing and what kind of uh, prices, for example, you won. You need an active networking, low threshold via social media, and also in real life, for example, with the, at the UPSA or at the, uh, and for example, the TAPS group. And you should participate and network in uh, the societies that have been found to promote uh, women in surgery. Benji Brooks was, was the first um, to, uh, to uh, find a group of uh, female surgeons at the EPSA, and they only sat together because they were not allowed to attend the golf and tennis classes at lunch where all the men went to. So they, uh, they met each other and they discussed how and what can be done to improve the situation of females in pediatric surgery. Nowadays, there are a lot of um, societies in uh, national and in internationally, like in Italy and in Germany and Switzerland. And you should, you should look out what is available in your country or also internationally and participate there. There are concrete networking programs, they have mentoring programs and they can support you on your way. And it is also 
um, the task of our surgical societies to advocate female surgeons. We need uh, equity, equity statements and policies. We need concrete solutions to uh, develop, encourage, and advance women as leaders. For instance, the Association of Women of, um, of Women Surgeons are now award, is now awarding um, a grant for um, women participating in classes to break the glass ceiling. What is also very important is the work-life work integration. And it's not about the work-life balance because it's almost never a balance, but it should become an integration. And this is not only true for the women, but also for the men. So it's about parents in surgery and the impact of parental and care res uh, caring responsibilities on surgical careers. It starts with an individual pregnancy. You see Julia here operating at the theater in Munich. And uh, if your female pediatric surgeon wants to operate during surgery, you should support her. In some countries, this is possible. In other countries, like in Germany, it's still hard. And we are happy that we can announce a positive list of all German um, uh, surgical societies together this year that say and state how um, you can realize that and how to support your fellows. And we should also be aware of the next a new generation of working dads. They also want to have shared parental leave, shared care for the children. They want to participate in family life and uh, they want to combine it together with surgery. Therefore, they should not be afraid to suffer from a loss of power and influence to, uh, from an increase in workload when they come back and an impeded career after parental leave. This is true for male and female. So to uh, prevent that, you should fix uh, pre-leave status. You should make a substitute scheme for during the leave and you should have a return policy for coming back. And also part-time is now reality in pediatric surgery. You see here in middle red, um, the number of females that are working part-time now in Germany um, displayed um, according to the different ages. And the number is still bigger than the ones of the males, very small. However, so at the moment, um, part-time is still a female thing. However, 50% of the consultants, one third of the trainees and one, uh, uh, one fourth of the trainees and one third of the leading aspirants plan to work part-time in the future. So part-time is reality and it is true for the females and the males. 30% uh, of them planning part-time are males. So what it needs is an individual working condition this contents of paternal leave, like you see here, uh, the male surgeon from our hospital, and for example, part-time um, uh, courses like here for us, also for the males and the females. And this depends on where you stand at the moment in your life, in your career, uh, what is about your relationships and what are the aims um, in life for you. And this may change um, during years and it, it, and it is an individual aspect that you cannot define um, overall for everybody, but you have to define individually according to your career plan. So taken together for overcoming the gender gap, it's not only about parity on proportions. We also need or especially need equity. So that means everyone has the same possible opportunities and you support them. Everyone needs something else, maybe uh, more support here with a child care, more support with the re uh, re research, more support by training. And if we do so, then we can reach equality. So that means women and men have the same outcome. So taken together, qualification is what matters. Everyone, males and females, need an individual life and career planning. And we have to support and empower the females, but also the fathers to uh, realize what they want to do. And of course, we should always be aware of our biases. Thanks a lot. And now I'm happy for the discussion, I think. Thank you very much, Julia and Steffi, for this great overview. 
And I'm particularly glad that you were able to pull up so many studies, studies from all over the world and from men and women and different surgical specialties showing that, yes, we do not have gender equality just yet, but there is a lot of people talking about it, a lot of people thinking about it, and that I believe will start the change. I think we have established that there is no equality just yet. And I would like to start looking into the future. Steffi, you already gave us some ideas on how we might be able to change how teams might be working towards a great team community and less gender inequality. And I would like to ask all our participants to ask questions and above all to tell us how they achieve great teams and less gender inequality in their situations and maybe tell us about their secret recipe on how it's working for them and how the solution might be for others. Please use the chat function to ask questions and to share your perspective. I will start with one question. Julia and me talked about simulation a fair bit and Julia is focusing in simulation. And she told me about one great opportunity during parental leave and simulation training. Do you like to share this idea? Yeah, so um, actually I wasn't planning uh, on doing so, but um, as Sabina said, I'm doing uh, research uh, in that field in, um, in our clinic. And while I was doing that uh, throughout my parental leave, I was thinking about just um, having a simulator at home. And yeah, it's uh, a really good opportunity to, to just keep practicing and keeping up. Um, and I would recommend that to everyone. And it's kind of a fun thing to do as well, <laughs> something else. Yeah, that's that's a concrete thing that you can do, definitely. Thank you. We have Claire commenting on role models. And I believe that is a really, really important issue. And all of us might try to think back on our first role models during our training and maybe role models later on in our career and wonder whether they are male or whether they are female. And if we do really have female role models out there that we can try to copy. And the older of us may recognize that they need to actually play the role of role models and really encourage their younger colleagues to aim higher. Um, can I ask uh, Julia and Steffi on, on that uh, in terms of, you know, you both mentioned that the importance of mentorship. Um, how did you get your mentor? Was this an organic process? Were you, you know, lucky to be chosen by your mentor? And, uh, you know, if you think, you know, some not maybe not everybody is lucky or in a position to have a, a mentor, what would you recommend of how how to you know how to approach uh, people asking them if if they would be their mentor? I think um, that uh, when I started 15 years ago, I, I uh, did not think about a career, to be honest, and how to come there. And I had, uh, I was lucky to be picked up by a mentor. But uh, I think nowadays, when I see the, the young trainees, and when they are still at the university, they come, they're really eager to see our institution. When they apply for a job, they come and visit us for two days, and they go to other places. And I think this is really a key po point in the beginning. So go and visit different hospitals, what fit, which one fits your pave and uh, your aims, and who can support you. And 
start networking really early. So discuss with your, um, for example, when you're doing a doctoral thesis uh, or discussing with friends and colleagues to get in. All right, thank you. And uh, Julia, what's your take on, on mentorship? So um, it's a little bit like uh, Steffi. I, I didn't go and look for mentors, but I was lucky to um, kind of find them while, while working in Lucerne and in Munich as well. And I think um, it's, for me, it doesn't matter if it's male or female mentor. Um, role models, I think it's really important to have, to just to see uh, women in leadership positions doing really complex surgeries and um, just to get rid of the bias. Um, I I think that mentors, uh, it's just really important to have mentors um, and that it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, I think. Thank you. There's Sabina? a comment in the yeah. chat room um, and I think we should um, look at um, our participants' perspectives as well. Now, um, one of the participants shared information about the UK that the training there, I believe residency training, is being set up to now work um, in less than full time as well. So they actually established a part time training program, which I find um, to be a great effort um, to be able to make it more feasible for, for females. So thank you very much for that comment. I didn't know that. And I believe that very few countries have established it just yet. I'd love more comments about that in the comment section. And then there's one question. Um, you presented a lot of the current literature um, say, saying things about the current state. Did you find any literature on systematic solutions? So Steffi and Julia, I think you're best qualified to answer that question because you looked at the literature very carefully and that's a very good question because there are a lot of um, uh, papers on the current state and there are also a lot of ideas but we don't have studies yet that show if you do this and that this will uh, result in an improvement of, um, of females in uh, careers so of course we have more females in the beginning and also in the training, but we still have this glass ceiling effect where when after the residency, it switches off and the male continue with the career and the females do not. So this is really, there's not a lot of uh, research that proves which method is working um, for, for, for females. In general, you can say, for example, that mentoring has, has been proven to improve the individual development and also uh, the, uh, reaching your career aims. This is one thing that is that has been shown. And of course, if you have like a, a better pregnancy um, and maternal leave um, set up at your country or in your institution, and you have the access to a good childcare so that the kindergarten does not close at four, but at seven, then this also improves uh, your work life integration and the parental and you don't yeah on the parental management. I picked up uh, two comments uh, from the web. Uh, uh, Goncha uh, from Turkey. Uh, she told us that nowadays they have more than fifty percent of female trainees. Um, and she believes that nowadays there are equal opportunities uh, provided uh, for both genders in, in Turkey. And uh, Kanval Zia from uh, Pakistan uh, told us that there are approximately 80% of residents are female. But I, I think we still agree all that when it comes then to the academic professorship, when it comes to lead leadership roles, that the, there is still the discre discrepancy between the, the two genders. Um, we talked about uh, the, the child care. Uh, Steffi, can I ask you, um, because you're in a in a department where paternal leave seems to be something that is quite well established. And 
apart from, of course, the benefits for your male colleagues that go on uh, paternal leave, can you also tell us, if, are there and what are the benefits for you as the female colleague uh, in, in the short and the long run uh, if something like paternal leave is available for your colleagues? What, what does it mean to the female uh, you know, surgeon? I think it really has a very big impact on the females because uh, um, always when you start a discussion about female careers, it's, uh, it stops at becoming a mother. Yeah, so this is like a key change point in the life of a female surgeon. And it's always addressed. So it's always like, yeah, okay, but they will become a mother or they will work part time and so on. So there are also a lot of biases on that. And of course, also reality, because still the women um, do most of the um, of the care work and of the household work and planning the holidays. Uh, and only the financial thing, financial things are in the hand of the man. So it's really like we are in uh, stereo, living in stereotypes. However, when we, I have the colleagues that are on parental leave, and they not only go for two months um, being on holiday, but really for six months, and also um, staying at home when the child is ill and so on. This opens the mind of everyone that um, shared care is reality and we need it. And when we have shared care, uh, we also encourage the females to do their way. way. So it's when uh, if a woman stays at home because the child is, is ill, it's like, yeah, okay, the child is ill, she's at home. But if it's doing a man, it's like, oh yeah, he is also staying at home and taking care of the child. So, um, you see, and I think to overcome these biases and to support the females and, and the males, both of them, as Julia said, we have like a family barrier on the one hand and a career barrier on the other hand. Yeah, it's also the, the males are kind of suffering from the situation. And I think this has something to do also with the generation X and, uh, and Z that we have, of course. But uh, and also the uh, focus work that we have and uh, that we really uh, need to have this discussion open minded. And as I said, it should not depend on your gender if you get a position or not, but on your quality and on your aims, of course. Thank you. We are speaking about working part time and um, doing both childcare and training as a surgeon at the same time. Um, Elke, you're in Canada now, and I believe the situation in Northern America is quite different. Is part-time working an opportunity, an option in Canada or the United States at all? Thank you, Sabine. Yeah, so, yes, I'm, uh, I've been working since uh, 10 years now in, in North America, in, in Canada, um, so I can speak mainly about uh, Canada, but uh, I also know how it works in in the U.S. And I mean, it's a it's a total different uh, perspective. In you know, I mean that that fills an, an entire uh, webinar. But uh, to answer your question, part time is not really something that except from a, a few uh, exceptions but uh, in in general it's not something uh, that is currently available but you know that now uh, gives a picture of oh oh you know that 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 it would be a very unfair uh, system and I don't think it's unfair but because there are other very, very important factors that actually contribute that uh, female and male surgeons are actually that the gap is is, is um, getting you know, smaller. So let me tell you, for example, we 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 talked about uh, the uh, it, it accomplished right that Julia was able to operate uh, while she was pregnant right and you had to fight for that in, in my understanding because it's not something that you're allowed although you feel yeah, like let's most of the women feel well feel absolutely you know uh, 
able to, to do this until the late stages uh, in the third trimester. And it's just not allowed, right? As you said, and I also know the reality that a lot of women are there for are hiding it as long as they can because to, to, to keep working. So in the States, in Canada, you can work uh, in the operating uh, theater until your last day, which in fact, I uh, did in in my with my first pregnancy, and it's not like to say or oh, how how great I am. It's just like it's 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 just the way it is. So it's not something very sp special at all. It's just uh, it's just uh, in the system. Of course, um, next step then is maternity leave, and especially in the U.S., it's we talk about weeks, right? Uh, and again, it's a whole entire discussion if this is you know ethical or not um but it's really it it tells us this is this double-edged sword of like protecting uh, women um uh, you know it maybe was as a in a good intention right we protect you but it's taking away opportunities because you you can't even choose for operating while being pregnant versus uh yeah uh, providing you this this freedom of of deciding for yourself um uh, i you know i want to i want to stay at home uh, longer and uh it's it's at least in north america it's not possible in in that extent so <laughs> It's it's quite complicated, right? It's not um it's not a black and white, uh, but there are good aspects, I think, in 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 all the systems. But there, I I haven't come across a system where you would think, oh, this is the ideal system, really, that uh, makes sure that there is no gender gap. I think the um, idea of part-time work intrigues some of our listeners. Um, there's one um, question for Steffi on how exactly part-time works, um, part-time works, works. So um, you're asked to elaborate in how you share the duties, how work is divided, whether the pay is different. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Of course, if you work less, you get, you're less paid. Um... I think that is normal, um, but for for our institution, it is like we have different kind of models. So it's not like you have to decide either full time or part time, fifty percent or whatever. So it's some of some of us have like one day off, and it's always the same day. Some some of us have like shorter days, and some of us has more frequently a day off, um, and this is individually as it helps uh, the your situation. And it's also not only for the families that people reduce their work or working hours, but also, for example, because they have other things in life that require um, time. And uh, so when we decide to, uh, to work part time, we discuss it in the team, how we can establish it. And of course, it, the, the most important thing is to run the hospital. Uh, but also to have like um, residents and consultants that can handle it and uh, that uh, can work there. And we, it's just, it's really always an individual um, decision. And then we arrange like uh, the wards um, and the rounds and the, the calls around it. There is one more question on regulations after maternity leave policies that are in place? I think this is a um, pretty general question. And I personally believe that the policies are very different depending on where you live and where you work. It might be um, legal issues involved in some countries. There's um, compulsory pregnancy leave in some places and optional even with some pay from the government, um, leave for childcare. Um, so it totally depends where you come from. And I believe you need to check locally what the rules and the policies are. Um, some hospitals might have specific benefits for women in place or parents that um, want to go away during um, childcare. So um, you will need to check locally. There have been a lot of comments in the 
um, chat about the amount of female surgeons pretty much all over the world. There's one comment from Asma saying in Algeria, 90% of the pediatric surgeons are female. So the trend we have seen in all the studies seems to be um, quite evident in, in our um, group as well. I would find it very interesting to hear if all these women work 100%, whether they have children. And in the past, women being surgeons played men. So they behaved like men, competed with everybody like other men. And whether that is true in most of those countries or whether they do it differently, do it the female way. If there's any comments on that, please share them or maybe um, Julia and Steffi want to comment on it. So do you think you need to behave like a man and be tough and all these social things, the participants yeah. of our first study um, were supposed to be? Or can you be yourself? Yeah, I think that's uh, part of what uh, Steffi said in her talk. That uh, I think it's um, yeah, just something you need to be aware of. That uh, you grew up throughout your whole life with this stereotype, in my case, of the busy bee. Um, and the male counterpart grew up with this stereotype of the yeah, of the typical surgeon with all the characteristics. Um, and I think it's just really important to pick the the uh, strengths um, and the characteristics that are yours and to be good at those. And not everyone is good at everything, but um, I think it's, yeah, for men and for women, uh, really important to be aware of uh, that you're biased. Um, you are definitely, and you need to be aware of that and just actively think about how do I want to be what what are my strengths and you can do that while you're planning your career like um, and that's the thing that I learned as well I just started working and then you're busy with starting and coping <laughs> but I think it's really important uh, as soon as possible to sit down and make a plan where what what are my aims and what are my my characteristics and yeah, you can do that all together, I think. And um, I, I just want also to underline that it's, um, as Sabine said, it's also the female's leader. Interestingly, it is not the way that they promote and support the female uh, trainees. Yeah, so uh, we I presented the study with the um, letters of recommendation and uh, the females did not write better letters the female leaders did not write better letters for the female trainings. And uh, this was also the same uh, when we looked at uh, the operation numbers. So it's really, as you said, uh, they are becoming more like the old white men uh, when they are um, in the leading position. And we should be aware of ourselves as females that we really support each other and network and uh, and uh, yeah, see our chances and not the other way around. I love that part of your presentation that in a letter of um, representation for women, the Sprouse's um, job was actually an issue. So it seems to be a very good quality to be able to find a partner that is maybe a PhD, has a PhD or um, something like that as well. It's bizarre. One doesn't really need to comment on it. Um, there is one more question in the chat section um, asking, is there a study on how well department heads are prepared to integrate and support part-time female colleagues? Um, Julia and Steffi, did you find anything on how department chiefs are prepared um first of all i want to say um that we have to be aware that we we have a lack of surgeons and we just need everybody 
yeah to uh, come to a pediatric surgery so and also like to uh, make contributions to the uh, to the surgeon and say okay if you if you want to go on parental leave or if you want to uh, work part time or if you want to go abroad for a research fellowship or for a clinical fellowship then we should admit it because on the one hand if you have like if you have a good work life integration you are happy and then you are also happy and a good worker yeah and um if you uh, if you if you don't support it you will have an unhappy uh, team and this contributes to uh, bad results in surgery so uh, this has been proven and uh, therefore um i think the head of departments most of them or a lot of them already realized that uh, the generation has changed uh, the roles are changing we have this the shared care and i think as i said it's really an important point that the uh, fathers go on uh, par uh, paternal leave and they participate activi activity in child care and uh, that we break up also these biases within our relationships so you should uh, and one career um, um, suggestion is also to be aware of whom you are uh, joining uh, for a relationship yeah and there was one question in the chat addressing this so there have been studies on surgeon couple couples and so both women and men were working working in surgery and they were asked who is doing which jobs in the family and the women did the child care, the household, the uh, the planning the holidays and uh, buying the presents for birthday and so on. And the men were only significantly more often taking care of the money. And um, the study was for, uh, I think, uh, 2017 or 19. So it's really uh, the, the way it is still today. And we have to yeah break up and go on with uh, different uh, role models and like for example uh, in my situation i most of the time work full time and uh, during that my husband was taking care of the child and the children so um, i think we always have to think out of the box and we always have to change um, what we are doing and what we are going to do depending on the current state uh, in life and career that we are, are in Steffi, thanks very much for this comment. Um, as a as a surgeon couple, I I that totally resonates with me also. Um, it sounds to me like the the last uh, questions that we are addressing that it's really of starting more and more to challenging the status quo, of starting with this stereotype image of a surgeon right like the typical picture of a surgeon and say well is there any evidence right that a surgeon has to have this characteristics in order to be successful and uh, Clarice she was uh, reminding us that there are studies uh, out there and I think Steph you Julie you mentioned it in your presentation also that studies have shown that female surgeons even have uh, better outcomes less complications so you re there are even data out there um, that definitely it has nothing to do with any characteristic traits but that's one of the stereotypes that is is still there and to that aspect, I think that even a patient still in his mind, not everyone, but some have a certain picture of, a, of, of the surgeon in their head. That's one status quo that I think needs to be dismantled. And another one is, as you mentioned, is like these roles in, in, in the household, right? It is, uh, you still, as, as a mom, uh, have to you mentioned like buying the the birthday presents have to organize the the, the summer holidays and all of that um, is that really just can that just be done by by females what I want to ask you both uh, Julia and Steffi what are your personal biggest challenges in in your journeys and how did you overcome them you know um Maybe you're happy to share with us.
Um, so, yeah, I think for me, um, the answer will, yeah, I am, because I just um, got pregnant or my pregnancy is not long ago. So, and I'm still on maternal leave. Until now, I wouldn't say that there there has been like a huge challenge the only thing is that I um, did a lot of paperwork until I was uh, able to uh, operate again but I, I didn't have to fight with um, with anyone about it it was just a lot of paperwork and um, especially with the, the head of my department I had a lot of support so until now I wouldn't wouldn't say that uh, there there have been um, many challenges compared to my male counterpart but that's also what you see in literature the the challenges start when you start your family life and i'm just at the beginning so, so i think uh steffi is uh going to be able to say a little bit more about that probably steffi what would you say was the biggest challenge so far in your journey um, I think the one big challenge was uh, that there was a time where I did not have like a mentor. And I think that is really crucial um, that you're like um, flicking around and you don't have an aim and uh, you just keep on going. Yeah. And, um, and I think there was, I saw a lot of women dropping out next to me on the way, um, which is also so the lack of role models to see how other women are doing it and are doing it in a good way. Um, and um, to find, I think to find a good balance between uh, your, uh, your family and your aims and your, your own characteristics, how you want to be and how you want to do it um, has been tricky. And um, of course, with the in increasing number of children, it's not easy, it's just different. Um, but uh, I always had a lot of support. And I think this is really without that, it would not have been working out. So I think it's really not one recipe for everyone. It's just really like an individual uh, career. And I think it's really crucial to know where you want to go. Thank you. We Thank are you, now well over an hour into our discussion and I think we have talked about very interesting aspects and concepts and I hope we have been able to transport some ideas and um, possibilities to increase our position as women in pediatric surgery. We would like to invite all participants to participate in a study we are currently performing and Julia could you maybe share your screen again and show the QR code of the link to the survey? While you are doing this, thank you very much for your presentation, Julia and Steffi and Elke for the co-moderation. I think without knowing each other, um, we did a very good job and um, this contact will allow us to network from now on. So um, we are having our personal benefits um, by doing or moderating this webinar. And the very last question in our chat was um, what we would say to someone who has no mentor or no good role model. And my opinion would be to, well, go out find a mentor, find a role model, email any of us, we might be able to help. Yeah. And I want to add that um, with regards to mentorship, uh, stay tuned. There is definitely more to come also within the UPSA organization because that's something uh, people more and more are asking for. And studies have shown that mentorship is unfortunately still, it's like a personal choice. It's, it needs to be happening organically. So it's not, you know, there's a lot of luck and uh, involved, but uh, this is something that where UPSA really uh, wants to do something in the future. So stay tuned.
I'm honoured to present Julia as the first speaker. She did her medical school training in Tübingen in Germany, did her PhD in medical psychology and ethics there, and came to Luzerne for her training in pediatric surgery, where she started doing some research in career opportunities in pediatric surgery. She is currently continuing her training in Munich at the Hauna Kinderspital and has focused her research in simulation, simulation training in pediatric surgery currently. One of her greatest achievements towards gender equality has been reached. She was the first woman to be able to continue operating during her pregnancy. Before that, and that was only last year, all women were banned from the operating theater when they announced their pregnancy. Julia, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sabine, for that uh, kind introduction. 